Thanks for listening to the Pope on Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me, my partner in crime. I'm um, the Pope in question, Reverend Steve, the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which you should check out because it's awesome. <laughs> so how you doing since last show? Uh, since last show, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Doing pretty good. I, um, I got a big, um, uh, uh, what's it called? I, I'm the manager of my own department at work right now. I got a promotion and, uh, that's good. I'm, I'm working more, getting more hours, making more money. That's all fine and dandy. Uh, but apparently my legs and feet and knees aren't happy about this. Boy, boy. Apparently they didn't get the memo. Oh, and my back has some issues with this as well. Uh-huh. Because I, for the longest time, I was a stay-at-home dad. I was working like, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week, just staying at home and taking care of the kids and sending kids off to school and cooking and cleaning. And now I'm working on like 38 to 42 hours a week, and it's the holidays. And, yeah, yeah it's 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 a challenge. I'm definitely not the spring chicken that I was back when I did this job before. I was mainly in my 20s. And so the amount of caffeine that I need to do this job is astounding. I'm drinking (laughs) an astounding amount of caffeine and an astounding amount of coffee. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. On the positive side, I do a lot of my favorite. I my favorite part of the job is I do story time once a week for the kids, and usually during the holidays, the company says, "Okay, well, no story times because it's going to be busy, and we want to sell things to people, so no story times." But right. the company has since had a, a change of thought, so now their belief is, "Let's do more story time. Let's let's do a story time this week. Let's do a story time next week." So there are times when I'm doing, like, this past week I did four story times during the week. And then this week I do. And then this week I'm doing one story time. And then the week after that I'm doing three, I think. So I'm I'm a a busy guy. So that's good. Well, I I try and see that brings the kitties in and then the mom's shop, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and my my versions of story times are very different. When I first started doing story time, because they, they don't teach you how to do story time, so I was very much your typical storyteller and just, okay, kids, sit down, put your listening ears on. Okay, well, we're going to read this story. Okay, don't interrupt me. But kids weren't into that because kids are – They're all ADD now, and they have no attention span, and they're just not interested in it. So at some point, I made a conscious decision of, okay, well, what if I get hyper enough to keep their attention? What if I get crazy enough? What if I change the story? What if I keep trying to go to sleep? How long can I pretend to be asleep until they start fighting back against me? What if I just... (laughs) What if I just make everyone explode in the book and everybody dies at the end? What are they going to do? Are they going to fight me on this? What if I try and read another book? Sometimes I'll get the very hungry caterpillar and I'll start reading where the wild things are. So I'm I'm always trying to throw a curveball at the kids. Recently I read the book Snowmen at Night. And in the book, uh, the snowmen have a snowball fight. And I tried to explain to the kids just how messed up that was. And one of the kids was like, look, they're having a snowball fight. It's cute. And I said, okay, well, after story time, you and me are going to go outside, and we're going to have a guts fight. I'm going <laughs> to rip off my skin and throw my intestines at you. You can throw a kidney or two at me, and we'll just laugh and have fun. Won't that be a blast? Yeah. It's a very Andy Kaufman story time, and I'm quite proud of it. Nobody else is doing anything like this right now because no one is uh, insane enough to do it. Yeah. But a lot of kids' programming nowadays just treats kids like they're absolutely stupid. And you get shows like Dora and, and stuff like that where 
where, you know, there's a bunch of clouds in the sky and the character is just, kids, do you see any clouds? Where? Let's count them. And I, I just remember being a kid and watching Monty Python and watching these things that, that you know, I'm proud of myself because I don't talk down to kids. I talk to the yeah. kids at story time the same way I would talk to my brother if we were at a bar, except without the cussing. Right. So have I'm, you, I'm proud of that. Have you considered mixing up, like, the stories with, like, you know, some of the works of the Marquis de Sade or anything like that? Every once in a while. Like, I'll start story time. Maxwell, what's wrong? Oh, I've got a baby crying in here. Okay. What, what's wrong, baby? Are you okay? Well, Maxwell, I told you, your mom exploded. Uh, he doesn't believe me when I said that his mom exploded. Uh. Oh, I, oh, well, there you go. Yeah, okay. I bribed him. <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll tell the kids. I'll be like, okay, kids, we were supposed to read where the wild things are, but I thought that was too childish. You kids want something more adult. So we're going to read this book. It's called The Stand, <laughs> and it's by Stephen King. Now, this is going to take about two weeks, so get comfortable. And whatever you do, don't boo. I mean, I might lose my place. This is a big book. And I'll literally just start reading the book, and, and it, it becomes a test, and we're going to see how long it's going to take for these kids to fight against the authority. Every story time I do is an interactive story time where the kids uh, have to band together to fight the evil villain. It's just that the evil villain is the guy in charge because he doesn't want to do story time. <laughs> so it's quite interesting to see which kids will be the ones to just kind of call me on my BS. Mm-hmm. At the last story time, I just decided that I was, I was just, at the last second, I was like, kids, I'm supposed to read these snowmen books for you. You kids don't want to read that. How about this? Bill O'Reilly's new book on presidential assassination. <laughs> And I read it for okay, quite a while. Okay, that's just right cruel. <laughs> yeah. And I get a lot of adults who come in because they hear what's going on and they can't believe it, and I'm just there just going, come on, kids, how come you don't want me to read to you this Bill O'Reilly book on presidential assassination? So I get a lot of adults, a lot of teenagers and stuff like that that are that become obsessed with story time because it, 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 I tell the kids, it's like, kids, sometimes Mr. Steve tells says jokes because they're funny to Mr. Steve. Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of times like I'll make a Godfather reference or I'll I'll I'll, I'll quote seven or something like that. Just because it's funny for me. Figure yeah. as long as it's funny to me, then the kids are just kinda of secondary. I make a lot of kind of plain jokes. <laughs> yeah. So I tell the kids, sometimes like, kids, I'm scared of two things. I'll be honest with you, I'm scared of two things. I'm scared of flying on an airplane, and I'm scared of snakes. So you would think I would be scared of snakes on a plane, but no, I found it to be entertaining. <laughs> I've never actually gotten around to seeing that one. It's pretty horrible. Yeah. It's a pretty horrible film. Yeah. But uh, uh, Keenan Thompson is in that movie, and I'm a a huge fan of his because he was on Keenan and Kel on Nickelodeon. Uh-huh. Just just one of those crappy Nickelodeon shows that they did. Keenan and Kel. Kel went on to be in Mystery Men and then tried to do a rap career and then failed. And now he's doing nothing with his life. But Keenan somehow managed to get on Saturday Night Live and now he's been on for like a decade or something like that. He's the longest running SNL cast member currently. He's been on longer than any other person who is currently on SNL, and I'm quite impressed with him. And in this scene, he get, in, in that movie, he got to save the day right up there with Samuel L. Jackson, and I'm like, good for you. I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. Who was the you other know? guy in Mystery Men? Uh, who was he in Mystery Men? Yeah. He, he was uh, the, the, the invisible, invisible boy. Okay, that's what I was thinking, because he was the only one I didn't know what his name was. <laughs> yeah. 
I like that, that movie, movie a lot. That's a fun that movie. movie was ahead of its time. <clears throat> yeah. Oh yeah. Almost definitely. Because Cause now superhero yeah, movies weren't work. as superhero movies weren't as huge back then as they are now. If you if you did Mystery Men now with that cast and with that with that uh, I mean. Dane Cook was in that movie, which was weird, because that was about a decade before anybody knew who he was. Yeah. And also, CeeLo was in that movie way before anybody cared about him. Eddie is it as well. I don't... I Eddie Izzard? Eddie Izzard's God, I love Eddie Izzard. Popular. God, I love Eddie Izzard. I was conf- I'm, I'm confused by Eddie Izzard now, because I, I think I said it in the last episode... The uh, AM radio station that used to be in Oklahoma City, uh, comedy 24-7, and they would play nonstop stand-up comedy. Whenever they would play an artist, afterwards they would have this woman that would say, yeah, Robin Williams, and then they'd go on to another comedian, and then Jerry Seinfeld. But for some strange reason, whenever Eddie Izzard would be on afterward, they would, the woman would say, Eddie Izzard. <laughs> I, I didn't. So now I'm all confused. Is it Eddie Izzard or is it Eddie Izzard? Have I been mispronouncing it this whole time? I mean, this is like a major radio station. What if I've just been fucking it up this whole time? It's, I'm quite confused now. Well, me personally, I, I am going to call him Eddie Izzard until he personally corrects me. That's a good call. That's a really good yeah. call. Yeah. If he wants to chime in on the situation, well, you know, it's him. It's his name. I, I would I would kind of have to bow to that. Yeah. But until then, <laughs> he's Eddie Izzard. That's a good call. Oh, my son oh, really wants to be... Yeah, my son really wants to be around. a part of this. You've got what? There's this bug going around town. And mm. I got it, so I just, yeah, I'm feeling really raw, really rough here. So, I don't know when the last time. And stuff like that, that's what's going on, huh? I don't know when the last time was I was actually sick. I know when the last time was I called in sick, but I don't know when the last time was I actually was sick. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think of it, but I just can't, like, I can't. It, at my work right now, oh, yeah, there's a huge bug and everybody's getting sick and it's just nonstop. Everyone's dropping like flies. But I think it's because I have kids and so my life is just a constant petri dish of grossness that maybe I'm I'm just a bit um, harder to get sick. Possibly. Because I'm constantly I don't cleaning know. up all this crap and stuff. Yeah. Because Jeannie. Jeannie is a preschool teacher, so she is around the little varmints all the time, and she is always bringing illness home. Yeah. Know? So, the, the germ-filled little maggots, ugh. I, I can yeah, say that. Be... I'm, not a, I'm not a preschool teacher, so I can say that to you. <laughs> yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. She I'm a storyteller, really but not all the time. Why didn't you? Go ahead. Why didn't you? Why didn't you tell me that Dudley Manlove from from Plan Nine from Outer Space was in this week's movie? I have no idea until I was sitting here watching it again because I watched it just before the show and I was just like, oh, duh. Why didn't I mention that? <laughs> I don't know why you, why you didn't mention that. I was shocked. I heard that voice because he because he's got that insane radio voice, that that mm-hmm. perfect radio announcer, TV, movie trailer voice, that sort yeah. of, in a world, perfect <laughs> voice. So, like, I'm, I'm watching the movie, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see his credit, like, in the credits or anything like that, but out of nowhere... I hear that voice, that insane <laughs> voice of his, and I wrote it down. The specific line, his first line in the movie, is um, 
the subject robot has not yet completed the transformation process in the duplicating lab, but because it's Dudley Manlove, his voice is just, the subject robot has not yet completed the transformation process in the duplicating lab. <laughs> and once I heard that, I'm like, oh, holy crap, it's Dudley Manlove from Plan 9 from Outer Space. I got so excited. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. And, and, because and, Dudley Manlove, number one, the greatest name in the world. Oh, yes. I'm a, I love Dudley Manlove. He really should have just been a porn actor with the name Dudley Manlove, but unfortunately, he wasn't a porn actor. He was just a regular actor. It, well, it would played. have had to have been gay porn. Yeah. I don't he was, stereotype him, but really, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. He was Eros in Edward's Plan and From Outer Space, and in this movie, he's Lagan, a clicker, so a humanoid, a robot. He seems mm-hmm. to be like one of the, the, like the, the head guys of this robot conspiracy. But the thing is, is that um, this film was not made too far away from Plan 9 from Outer Space. Uh, no, it wasn't. Plan- it's like early sixties there somewhere. I tried looking up when this movie was done. Everything on the internet says that this is a film from, this week's film is from 1962, but apparently there were screenings of the movie as early as 1960, which would mean that it's only like about two or three years after Plan 9 from Outer Space, which was all black and white. And this movie is in color and is apparently, it's, it's today's, this week's movie is a, is a strange one. I liked it. It was pretty awesome, but it's a strange one. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, but I'm glad. I'm very glad that you liked it. It is. It is so. It's not good, but it's got great parts. You know, it's it's a surprising film for what it is because it is a technically on the surface of pretty low-budget science fiction movie. I mean, there's hardly any costumes and hardly any sets and you know, it's pretty cheap and they use a lot of stock footage, so it really does seem like an early 60s B-movie sort of a thing. But it's a surprisingly deep film and it talks a lot about some pretty amazing issues. The last scene of the film just talks so much about God and the soul that it's surprising that this is coming from what seems to be a very crappy movie. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that since there's no... Well, first off about this movie, particularly when I was watching it this time, because every time I watch this movie, I do really get something different out of it, you know? And watching it this time, I'm like, okay, you know what? There is an Act 1 and there is an Act 3, and that's it. There is no Act 2 yeah. in this movie. Once we once we finish introducing all the characters, we're getting into the end of the movie, <laughs> you know? Yeah. There's, there's no middle part. Um, but there's no character development. There is no action. They go to a different set and they talk. And they talk a lot. So they come out with some of the most genius and interesting things that I am uh, I'm so surprised about that from, like, the late 50s and early 60s movie. Yeah. And I get the feeling that... Well, let me just run through it really quick, okay? So... Okay. This is after a nuclear war, and the humans from the radiation are all pretty much sterile. They're um, hold on. Have we mentioned the name of the movie yet? <laughs> I'm not sure if we did. This is I don't... Creation of the Humanoids on IMDb. It is claiming to be 1962, but like the Reverend mentioned earlier, um, it seems to have been out before that before I creation get an official release. Creation of the Humanoids also sounds very much like a Misfit song. 
yeah. and I can hear the song in my head. I can hear the, the bass line. I can hear everything about the fictional misfit song creation of the humanoids in my head. <laughs> they really need to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. So now the humans, I guess through um, having their population lowered in the war, they weren't too specific about that, have created robots to raise their quality of life. The robots yeah. have then evolved to a point where they are humanoid, and they are lovingly referred to as clickers, which is basically a racial slur against the robots, the humanoids. Yeah, I, I want to start using that in my own life yeah. as, as maybe like a new racial slang. I think for just for everybody who's not me, just gonna be, ah, yeah. I, that's exactly what a clicker would say. Damn clickers coming here, taking our jobs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I and really that's about it. As we discuss it, you'll get the rest of the plot. But I get the feeling that in watching this movie, they really did not intend for it to be as racially charged as it is. I get the yeah. feeling that the movie is actually about the fear of progress. But as we bring this movie into the 2000s, into the 21st century, you can really look at it and be like, this is a bold statement on race relations. Yeah. I thought, I thought of it as a, a bold political statement as well, because one of the major, there's a group who's against the humanoids, the clickers, and the group is called the Order of Flesh and Blood, which is essentially a, a science fiction tea party. They even yeah, dress or the in, Ku Klux Klan or something like that, you know. Yeah, they even seem to dress in Civil War outfits. I, I saw a lot of Johnny Reb hats in certain scenes with the Order of the Flesh and Blood. There, there's a there's a specific scene in the film too where uh, a group of the clickers, Dudley, Manlove, and the rest are talking, and one of the humanoids specifically says, and I wrote this down because I thought it was beautiful, uh, he specifically said, quote, there are always ultra-conservative pressure groups that are set against advancement, uh-huh. unquote. And I thought, wow, it's amazing that this 1960 film has... Uh, perfectly represented our current political state in America. Yeah. Good for this you. Is, this is one of the few movies that I would absolutely love the opportunity to remake. And yeah. I shouldn't say that out loud, but I say it because I get the feeling that if if like if I was going to remake this movie and you were going to remake this movie, you know, two separate movies, we would yeah. have two completely different movies. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm not afraid of saying that out loud. I would absolutely love to to rework this this story, you know, give it some updates and and remake it because I it is so bizarre. The costumes, yeah. the Civil War costumes, I kind of get you for that. I, you know, the whole thing looks like a stage play. You know. Yeah. Okay. We go to a scene, the camera doesn't move a lot, you know. I, I think they just had those costumes. I don't think that that was a, an actual conscious choice. Speaking of the costumes, they had them speaking in the of, Civil War. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the, the wardrobe, I looked up a lot of the people that were responsible for this film because I, I always find it interesting to see what else they did. For example, the film was was written and directed by Wesley Berry, who was apparently a really big uh, child star during the silent movie era, which is weird that he went from being a child movie star in the silent era to directing Creation of the Humanoids. The the star of the film, Don McGowan, he was the last person to be the creature from the Black Lagoon. He was in the outfit during The Creature Walks Among Us, which was the last one that kind of sucked. But after creation of the humanoids, he started focusing more on westerns and ended up being in freaking blazing saddles. 
And I'm really? quite impressed with that. Yeah. The idea that one of the people in Creation of the Humanoids went on to be in Blazing Saddles, that's pretty awesome. So, so then uh, Dudley Manlo. Huh? Yeah. In, uh, Blazing Saddles, but I know he's in it. The cinematographer. Yeah. Yeah. The cinematographer was Hal Moore, and I thought that that was familiar, and I looked him up. He's on the goddamn Hollywood Walk of Fame, the the cinematographer for cre- Creation of the Humanoids. And again, he, he won two Oscars in the 1930s and 40s. He did a, a, a Midsummer Night's Dream in 1935, and he won an Oscar for that. He was right. the cinematographer for Phantom of the Opera in 1943, and he won an Oscar for that. He was nominated for a third Oscar. He was nominated for a Golden Globe. And he's on the goddamn Hollywood Walk of Fame. The makeup was done by Jack Pierce. Yes. The guy <laughs> responsible for freaking Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, he did the makeup for this. Mm-hmm. And since this is 1960s, I got the feeling that, like, oh, well, you know, it, it seems like a lot of people who once had a prime. Because Hal Moore was getting... Oscars in the 30s and 40s, and here's the 60s, and he's doing this. Jack Pierce was responsible for most, if not all, of the makeup for the monsters during the classic Universal Monster movie focus, you know, and now it's the 60s, and he's doing this. But I was focused on the fact that when I was looking up all the people who were responsible for this film, the wardrobe was done by a man named Oscar Rodriguez. When I see these bad movies, I usually don't see a Mexican name mm-hmm. in any sort of the uh, the 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 behind the scenes sort of thing. Usually, don't see a Mexican name, and I definitely don't see a Mexican name when it comes to the wardrobe. And I I couldn't find anything on this Oscar Rodriguez gentleman, and I'm quite intrigued by it. I want to learn more about the Mexican man who apparently came up with the wardrobe for creation of the humanoids. I'm writing fan fiction in my head for this man. I I especially want to ask him about the one character who was just in the one scene who was apparently a cop in his cape and little fireman helmet. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I really want to know about the Mexican man who apparently came up with this. Like, did he do anything else? Is it, 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 I'm quite intrigued by it. There's a Mexican yeah. man who came, who was hired to do the wardrobe for creation of the humanoids. What is your deal, sir? <laughs> Where did you come from? Where did you yeah. go? Yeah. What What's happened? your story? Share it uh-huh. with me. I want yeah. to know more about you. Yeah. Don McGowan, though, man. What a face. You know, and you really got to wonder why a guy like that didn't go further because he had. Just the classic look of he a does look man like a leading man, time. yeah, yeah, and man, you could snap him into a Superman outfit in a second. Yeah, he's you got know? that he's got that deep movie actor voice. It reminded me of the uh, the Ace Test pilot from This Island Earth. Yes, that sort of exactly. Wait a moment. Mm-hmm. Wait a moment. We need to go into the future. That sort of deep voice that all those leading actors had back then. Yeah. With his square the... jaw and his cleft chin. Yep. You know? Yeah. And and he played a, a very good douchebag. He did. He did do a he did do a very good uh douchebag in this film. It's a bizarre film because technically it's a sci- science fiction movie. It's set in the future, but it seems like it doesn't want to be a sci-fi film because there's no action, there's no big fight scenes. It, it, it's 
it's almost a drama. Yes. Uh huh. Very much so. I especially yeah. liked the fact that the the Don McGowan, the one of the heads of the Order of Flesh and Blood, learns that his sister is quote in rapport with a humanoid. I- which I I'm assuming is science fiction that. for for their banging. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm assuming no, that a, means. It was a bit more than just they were banging. It was almost a type of marriage. Yeah, it was almost a type of marriage. It was almost a type of they seem to be sharing a brain or something. But also well, he implied was, they're banging. Oh well, well they were definitely banging, which which made me wonder why was he so shocked? I mean, it's not like the first time a woman was banging a machine, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it was kind of like he was reprogrammed to be basically her perfect lover. Yeah, you know, and that's why she had the line with well, you, well, they had that conversation where. Uh, Don McGowan was like, well, doesn't it bother you that, that he could be doing this with any woman? And she was like, no, because then he would be in rapport with her, which kind of implies that he would have then been reprogrammed and he would have been a different creature. Yeah. He would not be the same android that was with her. It's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm surprised at how cerebral of a movie this was. There are yeah. a lot of deep thoughts in here, especially near the end and the semi-surprising twist at the yeah. end of the film. Suddenly they're talking a lot about, well, um, do humanoids have a soul? If I have the entire memory and if I remember everything that happened when I was a human, but I'm a humanoid now, do I still have a soul? Am, am I still a creature of God? I was quite surprised at that. I was surprised at the fact that, oh, well, here's this crappy-looking sci-fi movie that's suddenly talking about God and souls and eternal life. And I, I was surprised at that. I it was impressive. I wasn't expecting yeah. this movie to get as deep as it did. There are some pretty deep thoughts in this film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there are quite a few deep thoughts. We had the the main humanoid. I mean, he wasn't like the lead humanoid because I do think that that was pretty much Dudley Manlove. But Dudley Manlove. Dudley Manlove. God, I love that. I will, I will deliver that pizza. Right. Um, the one who drove the plot more. Yeah. Let, let's refer to him like that. Uh, I think he was Anton? Acto. I'm pretty sure Acto. Um, okay. get their names confused, where he had a conversation with Dr. Raven, and I forget how it kicked off, but then he was like, well, at least I know who my creator is. Yeah. And he named and gave a brief biography of the man who created the humanoids. And he was like, "Um, well, who created your creator? Well, your creator. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, doesn't that make us brothers? I was thinking, doesn't that make you more like cousins? Yeah. Yeah, you like know, maybe or, second cousins. Yeah. Yeah. Or not. Like oh, yeah. cousins. Yeah. I can't be a cousin with a Damn clicker. <laughs> because mm-hmm. Planet from Outer Space, Ed Wood's magnum opus, Planet from Outer Space, was 1958, 1959, and if this movie had pre-
previews in the 1960s, then Dudley Manlove was doing black and white Plan 9 from Outer Space and then taking a hop, skip, and a jump right to this color movie. Because black and white movies were still being made because it was a lot cheaper. But for whatever reason, uh, the director, Wesley Berry, the silent movie star, apparently just decided, well, my movie is going to have color. But it's, and the color is isn't weird. adding that much. There were some parts where I thought, well, you know what? If this was in black and white, then it's, I don't know. It's, there, there might be more. I could, might be able to give more respect to the film because it would seem yeah. older. But that's really where most of the budget of the movie had to have gone because that color absolutely was expensive, and it's particularly in that time to make a color movie. You know, yeah. So, uh, so it it looks low budget because most likely most of the, most of that money went into the film. What an amazing movie. And, appa- and apparently, I, and I feel that this should be mentioned, this was um, considered to be um, Andy Warhol's favorite film, or one of his favorite films. Yes. Yeah, that's always kind of the footnote. And <clears throat> the only time I've ever agreed with Andy Warhol, because other than that, I thought he was kind of an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. He seemed to be like... Like uh, Albert Einstein, he seemed to be one of the first people in American society who really understood the cult of celebrity sort of a thing. Where it's like, okay, well, I may be a genius, I may not be a genius, but I know how to act like a celebrity. Mm -hmm. So guess what? I'm going to be all over the place. But apparently, and I looked this up because I heard a lot of I, I heard a lot of people talk about they because cause yeah, every time I looked up creation of the humans it always said Andy Warhol Andy Warhol so I looked it up and apparently he was doing an interview in a newspaper about his latest art exhibit and right in the beginning of it he automatically started talking about this movie that he had just seen that he thought was amazing and just talked about the plot of Creation of the Humanoids. And afterwards, he said that it was just one of the most amazing movies he had ever seen and that everyone should go out and see it. Which is weird, because when you think of movie reviews, you don't think of Andy freaking Warhol. But I don't know whether or not this was his 100% favorite film, but I can tell you that uh, it's... He had to have liked it. I know that. He had to have really liked this film. You know what else? You know what else I realized? Uh, I I have learned. Um, uh, what's his name? Elvis Presley was apparently obsessed with the movie Money Python and the Holy Grail. Aldous Huxley, yeah. Uh, No, Elvis Presley. Oh, Elvis Presley. Sorry about that. The phone cracked. No, he was, he was apparently obsessed with uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and he would bring people to his house so that they could watch it together. Really? I love well, that. Yeah. I absolutely love the idea of probably Fat Elvis, because it was that <laughs> period in time, of Fat Elvis just meeting people and just being, hey, baby, I've got this movie at home. you got to come and see it. It's absolutely amazing. There's all these British people. I hardly understand what they're saying, but it's so funny. There's this rabbit. He gets all angry. It starts biting people. you got to see it. It's incredible. just love the idea of Elvis quoting Monty Python. Yeah. That's just wonderful. You know what's really fun to do? Do you have a copy of The Holy Girl? You've got to have a copy. Oh, yeah. i got a copy of it. Does your does your copy have the uh, the Japanese dub? Yes, it does. Watch it. Watch watch Monty Python, The Holy Grail, completely in Japanese. It's still hysterical. I need a new DVD player is what I need because we lost our remote about, I don't know, six months ago, maybe a year ago. And so yeah. we we watch movies 
and that's pretty much it. We can't watch yeah. <laughs> any special features. We can't watch any commentary anymore. We're just kind of stuck with pressing play on the DVD player, and that's it. So pretty soon we're going to need to upgrade to something that has an actual remote so we can actually watch something like that. Because, oh, yeah, the the Money Python and the Holy Grail DVD that just that came out last year, oh, there's so much to that. Mm-hmm. There's so much extras and ah, oh, it's wonderful. But no, I'm 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 stuck just watching the movie right now. But my kids were obsessed with that for a while. Both of my daughters were just obsessed with Money Plays on in the Holy Grail for like this beautiful like year or two, where they would just ask mm-hmm. to watch it over and over again. And I was such a proud father mm-hmm. because my kids make me watch some pretty horrible crap. But I was really proud when they were obsessed with Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Monty Python and the Holy Grail was like the first thing people started doing on the Internet. And that's how you met people. You would start talking to somebody and you would just start swapping lines back and forth. And you would wind up responding the whole movie to each other. I was really late getting on the Internet. Yeah, I probably like ninety six or ninety seven, some really late period in time like that. I remember always having one friend who would take you to some chat room or some bulletin board somewhere around ninety four, ninety five, or ninety six. I didn't get on the internet for much, much later in my life, but I can't imagine my kids growing up with the internet. And also, did you know that that was the origin of the term spam? Really? That's wonderful. I I mean, I think I knew that, but I think maybe I knew that like 14 years ago, but it's odd to hear that now. Yeah, computers were a lot smaller. You really couldn't pass as much information. And if somebody pissed you off, you would email them the script to the Monty Python sketch spam. And it would be too big for their it would be too big for their email inbox and they would not be able to get any more email until they got in touch with the with the administrator to have it delete it out. Oh well that's great. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. My kids were obsessed with spam for a while too. That was really that was yeah. a wonderful period in time. <laughs> mm-hmm. God. And it was also very interesting that where Don McAllen's character was Kragus, he was often referred to as the Kragus. Yeah. And his girlfriend was a tramp. Yeah, it's weird that you say girlfriend because I feel it's, it was just one of those movie things where it's like, oh, in the beginning they meet each other for a minute. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle of the film they meet each other again for, what, two minutes. And then next thing you know they're in love with each other. Well, then they're making out. And then just yeah. before the humanoids showed up to take them away, they were talking about breakfast together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which definitely implied that they were going to go back and start pumping uglies. Yes. And I love the fact that the movie ends with a character looking right at the audience and dropping some bizarre, strange, uh, cryptic twist. You know what that reminds me of? I don't know how much we really want to spoil this one. Do you know what that remind me of? What did it remind me of? What did it remember, remind you of? Remember the Rankin Bass version of Return of the King? No. 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 Continue. Oh, oh, Return of the King. Oh, you said Rankin Bass, and I automatically was thinking of like claymation Christmas crap. No. Yeah. No. This is the. Uh, Yeah, this was the animated, the sketch animation. Yeah, okay. 
and at the end, um, Gandalf is talking, and, and well, he, the, the line comes up like, "In this new world, where there'll be, will there be room for hobbits?" And then Gandalf starts pointing out, "Well, Sam is bigger than Frodo. Uh, Mary is bigger than Sam. Pippin is bigger than Mary." So implying that hobbits are going to evolve into humans. <clears throat> and then the Gandalf character, cartoon, looks at the camera and says, is there hobbit in you? <laughs> nice, yeah. That is nice. And almost the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is a good that is a good reference. That's nice. Tying tying that in. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to oh, think that oh. we have off I'd like to think that the ending was completely thought of thought up on the fly by my man Oscar Rodriguez. Yes. <laughs> the, the Mexican wardrobe artist that they flew in from Mexico City. To spice up the movie. I also like the fact that for the clickers, they seem to be using the same bizarre eye special effects that they used in the movie. Uh, what was it? The Brain from Planet Aris? Was that the movie? Where the characters are essentially wearing mirrors in their eyeballs. Yeah, I, I'm just I'm just picturing. Yeah, I can't. You know, as soon as you said that, I can't get this other movie out of my head. Which, what the hell was it? The ones where they had the ping pong balls for eyes. Uh, Killers from Space. Yeah, so I'm kind of stuck there. Peter Graves. Yes. That was that one. But no, the brain, the brain from Planet Aris, and and the I think it's John Agar who stars in it. Yeah, and uh -huh. he he becomes almost possessed by this alien being, and his eyes it literally it's it's almost creepy looking because it just literally looks like they got this massive contact that is made of pure glass and put it in his eyes because it's just a bizarre freaky look, and they seem to use that with the clickers in this film. Yeah, it's a really they weird way. Like hell. Yeah, really weird way to. Like a bizarre special effect. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because they if they if you also look at them. If you also look at them, you can tell that while they're wearing those things, they can't blink. Yeah. It you know they don't blink, but it doesn't look like they can. Yeah. You know, so imagine that. That my God. And and also in in Plan Nine from Outer Space. Uh, what's his name? Tor Johnson. He's, when he is resurrected as the living dead, he's got these all white eyes. And I always wondered how they did that back in the day, because nowadays you just pop in some context. But apparently, they would literally just kind of get egg whites and shove them in his eyes. Yeah. And that's got to be Ooh. hell. Yeah. That's got to be just absolute hell on earth, like screaming in absolute pain. So I can't imagine how they do this special effect in the brain from Planet Eris and now in the creation of the humanoids where they've got these glass-looking eyes because that's got to be pretty damn painful. In the credits, they list Jack Pierce as the makeup artist, but then they list a second name, a doctor, something or other weird name, as the eye special effects. Which is interesting. And seems to suggest that, like, okay, this is some sort of weird, bizarre thing that they're doing here with these eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, and back in that day, I mean, it's not like they were doing that a whole heck of a lot. So these have to yeah. just be, like, early experiments with trying to do something yeah. with people's eyes like that. 
Oh, hey, um, this is in no way related to the movie that we're talking about, but I wanted to mention a book. Okay. I wanted to plug something. It's a book. A, I, I, I work at a bookstore, so occasionally I get advanced reader copies of books. And it's right. a book, and it's not coming out for a month or two or three, and there's no... It, it hasn't been spell-checked yet. It hasn't been edited. It's a very rough draft of the book, and you get this tiny little paperback, and you you kind of get a taste of it, and there's a lot of spelling mistakes, and you get to find those, right. and it's all quite fun. The last one that I got that I cared about was a number of years back, we got a, a bunch of advanced readers' copies, and they just sat on the break room table, and everyone grabbed them and went for them and 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 stuff like that. But there was one that was on the bottom of the pile that nobody wanted to get because we we had read the back, everybody had read the back, and we found out that it was some sort of zombie romance, and nobody wanted to touch that. But one day I didn't have anything to read, and I'm like, okay, I'll pick this book up, and it was called Warm Bodies. And it was four months until the book had come out. But I read it, and I fell in love with it, and I started telling everybody about it. And I'm like, okay, this book, it's coming out in three months. But you're going to want to remember it. It's called Warm Bodies, and it's a zombie romance horror thriller comedy. Now, trust me, it works. It's really great. And uh, it, it got turned into a movie, and the movie was pretty good. Warm Bodies. And this book... This warm book here bodies. is okay. I didn't hear it first. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, warm bodies. It was a, eventually came out, and it was a fairly good seller. And they turned it into a movie, and it came out a couple of years ago, like two or three years ago. And it was really good. It's a pretty good movie. It, yeah. it it's a horror movie, but it's also a romance, but it's also a comedy. It's it's a good movie. It's worth a watch, at least. But I got this book. Uh, a week ago, and it's coming out at the end of January, and I'm super excited about it. I, yeah. I, oh, I just, I'm telling everybody about this book. It's by Matthew Riley, and he's some sort of best-selling author, but I've never read any of his stuff. It's called The Great Zoo of China, and here's what it's about. I'm going to lay it right down on the line for you. It's Jurassic Park. In China, with dragons. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm in love with this book. <laughs> I, I saw the cover, and it's it's this red cover, and it's got fire on it. And I'm like, the Great Zoo of China. Wait a second. Is this about dragons? Is this about dragons? And they don't mention dragons on the cover. They don't mention dragons in the back. There's a letter inside of my version from the editor talking about how great it is and how people are going to love it. And there's no mention of dragons. But I'm like, you know what? I think this is about dragons. <laughs> so I started reading it. And right in the beginning, there are these quotes about dragons. And I'm like, holy shit, is this a Jurassic Park with dragons? That would be awesome. So, yeah, you see this. It, and and apparently this Matthew Riley guy it has ADD because all of the the stuff you are expecting comes really really quick. Like you see the first dragon in page thirty or forty, something like that. Right. And then you know that eventually everything's going to go to shit, and that happens in like page ninety, like really quickly. But I love the fact that here I am going, oh my god, this is Jurassic Park with dragons. This is Jurassic Park with dragons, and one of the characters literally just says. Okay, uh, so you guys are Chinese. Did you get Jurassic Park in China? Because we all know this is going to go to shit. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that here I am saying, okay, this is Jurassic Park in China, but the author is smart enough to, to mention Jurassic Park in this book. Like, I liked that. I respected that. Yeah. Because here I am saying, this is Jurassic Park in China, and, and at least the author knows that people are going to say that, enough to mention Jurassic Park in the book. But I am just having so much fun with this book. It is so much fun. And when I read it, I can almost see the eventual movie, and I can almost see the eventual, I don't know, action figures and video games and stuff like that. This is going to be huge. And I'm telling 
everybody about it. The Great Zoo of China. It's going to be amazing. Oh, and also China's going to hate us for it. But it's yeah. going to be great. It's going to be great. I can't wait to see the horrible CGI. Uh, uh, what's his name? That guy that I hate that makes all of those horrible movies. Michael Bay. I can almost see the Michael Bay CGI monstrosity dragons that they come up with for this movie, but it's going to be wonderful. (laughs) It's an absolute great book. Everybody needs to go grab this when it comes out in January. The Great Zoo of China. It's going to be amazing. Jurassic Park for dragons. You can't beat that. Yeah, I can't find anything... Oh, there it is. Great Zoo of China. It looks like he's hawking it on his own website. Yeah, it's not coming out for a while. It's not coming out until the end of January, so there's no there's no buzz about it yet, but, oh, man, this is going to be huge. Speaking well, of dress... Yeah, if, we, if we're mentioning it on the show, I do like, if, I, if it's possible, to get it over onto our page so people can check cool. it out. All right. Speaking of, I just saw the preview for the new Jurassic Park movie. I've been hearing about it. I haven't watched it. Well, I I didn't care too much about the second Jurassic Park movie, and I guess the third one was okay, but I quickly stopped caring about Jurassic Park. Yeah. After the first Jurassic Park. But I became interested in this new Jurassic Park reboot because of the concept that they came up with. The whole idea that, well, eventually some company came along and they got it under control, and so Jurassic Park is now an actual park the way that John Hammond dreamt for it to be. It's a tourist destination. People go there, and it's very popular, and people love it, except now people are starting to not not love it because it's been around for a really long time, and people are getting bored with seeing... Uh, T-Rexes and all of that crap, so they start experimenting with the dinosaurs, and that's when everything goes to crap. Uh-huh, and also okay. Chris Pratt is in it from Guardians of the Galaxy, and I love that. Yes. Because I love that. Yes. Well, you were also a, a big fan of uh, Parks and Rec- Recreations, which I never watched. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I yeah. was. There aren't too many. That show is right up there with with just those shows that, like, at any point in time, I can watch any episode of that, and it'll just be absolutely wonderful. I, I love that. I love that show. Plus, my uh, my heterosexual man crush, Adam Warrock, did a whole album of Parks and Recreation music. Yeah. Because he's amazing like that. And I love him, <laughs> secretly. It's not a secret, dude. <laughs> I, I love him unsecretly. Okay. <laughs> He's an amazing man. I love him. He released an entire album of Futurama, Futurama rap songs. How can you not love a man who does that? It's amazing. <laughs> he deserves a fruit basket or something for that, because that's freaking amazing. <laughs> But I love this idea that they have for Jurassic Park. Like, I can get behind that. Jurassic Park was released, and it's a park, and everybody loves it, but now they're bored with it, so we got to do something. That I, I can get behind. I saw Jurassic Park, and I thought it was really a pretty amazing movie, and then I liked it less and less on subsequent rewatches. You know? Oh, there are so many things wild. wrong with that movie. Yeah, it just got to be like, yeah, the dinosaurs look really cool, but there's really nothing else exactly here. You know? Oh, yeah. It's not a very it's... complicated plot. It's kind of like run here, run there, do this, do that. You know, there's nothing There's nothing there. So as the other Jurassic Park, Park movies came out, I just gave them a pass. There are so many, like, holes in that film, too. Like, film flubs and problems. And one of the things that I just love doing now is pointing those out to people who cherish this movie as an as an absolute treasure. 
Yeah. Like the fact that raptors were the size of chicken. That's a pretty big hole. That's really that's really how big an actual raptor was? Yeah. Raptors were about the size of chickens, and they were covered in, in feathers. Yeah. I And that was one of the things that disappointed me, man. I, I didn't like that the focus of that movie switched over to raptors. I, I want to see T-Rexes. I want to see... You know, giant, the big ones fight. You know, I don't want to see the human-sized lizards trying to kill people. The one specific thing about Jurassic Park that always bugged me is uh, at the end they're escaping through the air ducts, and yeah. they're slowly but surely crawling around the air ducts, and then the annoying young girl suddenly gets raised up because there's a raptor, and the raptor has come up through the ceiling and is lifting her up. Her tile of the ceiling is being raised up by the raptor's head, but then somebody kicks the raptor, and the raptor falls a drastic amount to the floor below. So how the hell did the raptor get up there to lift her tile in the air? Did the raptor float up there? Did the raptor have a uh, jetpack of some sort? Have these have these raptors learned ladder technology for the raptor to get up there so high? Okay. Then there's the moat now, in. Then there's the moat in the T Rex that needs to be talked about. The moat that isn't there that magically appears. Well, wait a second. Let me just chuck this in real quick. But if you give me a movie with raptors with jetpacks, that I'm watching. Well, see, that's what's so great about the Great Zoo of China. Because those are raptors that can sigh. Because yeah. they're dragons. <laughs> that's what's so great about the Great Zoo of China. It's dragons. It's Jurassic Park with dragons. How amazing is that? Mm-hmm. Love this damn book. But no, when you see the T-Rex in the beginning, the T-Rex just walks out of the, out of its pen, out of its cage. But then when, uh, the lead guy and his two annoying kids, sidekicks, they are escaping, they go over the fence and suddenly there's this big massive moat that wasn't there before. That just, I guess, magically appeared because these dinosaurs have, are warlocks? Mm, maybe. Oh, you know what movie we should, we should, we should talk about? You know what movie we should focus on? It's on Netflix. And I consider it to be one of the scariest horror films in the world. It's a documentary called Jesus Camp. Have you ever seen Jesus Camp? I have seen Jesus Camp, yes. Oh, my God. What, a, what an amazing film. I was watching it one day, and I was, I was watching it one day, and everybody was in their room, and everybody was, was doing their own thing, and I was just on the couch, and nobody else had the TV. So I said, let me watch something. And that's always been on my queue on Netflix. So I said, you know, whatever, I'll watch this. I've always heard about it so I will watch it. And so yeah. my youngest daughter, who was eight at the time, came out and said, Daddy, what are you watching? And I told her, I said, I'm watching a horror movie, but it's real, and it's called Jesus Camp, and it's about a camp. It's about a church camp where kids go. And she goes, oh, well, I love Jesus, and I love the Bible, and I'll sit down, and I'll watch this with you. And she was just horrified. She was absolutely horrified by what she saw, especially because she's a huge Harry Potter fan. And the woman in this movie who runs the camp goes off on Harry Potter in this yeah. way that, in this amazing way that my daughter, she was eight, but she, I literally had to hold her back from breaking the television. She oh. said, I, I want, I want to break the Netflix. I'm so upset. So obviously being a good dad, I got that bit of dialogue from the movie and made it an MP3 file on my phone that I can play all the time. (laughs) 
So now if I ever want to upset my youngest daughter, I just have to find the song. It's list, it's called Warlocks on my phone, and I press it. And the, the fat southern Christian woman who runs that camp, she just... And while I'm on the subject, mm-hmm. let me say something about Harry Potter. <laughs> Warlocks are enemies of God. And any time that comes on, any time that comes on my phone or or I put it on CDs now if I'm making a mixed CD or something. Like I made a CD for my – I made a CD for her recently, and I put that as track two or track three just to kind of keep her on her toes, you know. (laughs) She's listening to music that she likes, and she's loving it, and then suddenly – And while I'm on the subject – And right there, she'll just put her – fingers in her ear and my daughter will start screaming and just la 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 I can't hear you because she's just so upset that this woman which is interesting because my daughter apparently found God on her own and maybe with some help from her grandma but but you know I'm not I love church I love going to church every Sunday Mm -hmm. okay I love making fun of church every Sunday yes I used to live tweet, and like I would go to church every Sunday in Seminole, and I would just live tweet because it, it was amazing. Apparently, <laughs> at the church I would go to in Seminole, Oklahoma, the preacher specifically said that there was more proof that Jesus existed than Washington. So he said, if you believe that Washington existed, and there's hardly any proof that he ever existed, then you have to believe in Jesus. And, of course, everybody's clapping, just, right, man, brother, right, man. Mm-hmm. Ah, it was wonderful. I love church. Well, that's because I don't think that people who actually sit in church and attend church because they believe are actually fucking listening to anything that's being said. No, I don't think they're paying attention. opportunity to say praise God or hallelujah or amen or something like that. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. There there was another good one. I just looked on Netflix, and unfortunately it's not there. Have you seen Hell House? Oh, you know what? I've got got that on my queue, but I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. I really wanted to. You might want to check the queue. It's 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 great, and it had one of the greatest lines ever. I just I just laughed. Really, because warlocks it. are enemies of God is a pretty amazing line. What's that? I, is it a good line? Because warlocks are enemies of God is a pretty damn good line. Yes, it is. Uh, this one, this one. So now, Hell House is a documentary of these Christian Halloween houses that they put up. And they, you know, instead of zombies and stuff like that, they create little scenarios of, oh, gay people having AIDS and going to hell and people who have abortions going to hell. and all It's, this funny, it's funny that you mention that because in October, uh, Norman, which is the city where I work at, was visited by a traveling hell house called the 99. Yeah. And suddenly there were all these 99 trucks all over the city, and there was this big giant tent that took over a giant parking lot, and it said, the 99, come and experience the horror. The 99, your life will never be the same. And apparently they're this, just like that hell house sort of a thing, Except they've got a massive budget and they don't tell anyone that they're religious. Mm -hmm. I learned about them on Facebook because one of my friends just said, Oh my God, the 99 just appeared. We need to protest them. This is horrible. I can't believe it that the 99 is here. And and I, I, I told her, I said, wait, I don't know what the 99 is. I've never heard of this before. And apparently they're this ultra conservative, ultra religious group that has spent like, like almost a million dollars on this traveling hell house that just Probably teaches them. yeah that teaches people about just the the horrors of of gays and the horrors of drinking and the horrors of smoking and the horrors of having sex but it's so ultra violently graphic 
that once yeah. it's done, the last room is a giant prayer circle where you are told how horrible you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They they had this one guy, and this is what cracked me up. And you know, he was talking about how he used to go to raves all the time and take ecstasy and stuff like that. And you know, until he was saved, and you know, there were a lot of date rape drugs going around on these raves, and so that's what he was making his little scene about. He was making it about this rave and the date rape drug, and he was like, I, I I've done a lot of research on this, <laughs> and I I. And it's going to have a date rape drug in it. I forget what it's called, but it is an official date rape drug. And my mind took that ball and fucking ran with it. And I'm thinking, like, (laughs) what the fuck is an official date rape? Is there a date rape committee? And that's what I pictured. I pictured that there was a date rape committee, and they were looking at this drug, and they were like, yep. That'll do her. <laughs> Roofies, the official date rape drug of the NFL. <laughs> and exactly how does the date rape committee test the date rape drugs to decide whether it is an official date rape drug or not? I don't know, but I bet that they could get a sponsor in Bill Cosby. That's kind of what was just running through my mind right now. Boom. Bill Cosby yeah. could be the spokesperson. Because I imagine that what Jello and everything doesn't want him anymore. So those would be good commercials. When I am wanting to rape a woman, I use the official date rape drug. Yeah. That was just that was a that was a Russ Bill Cosby impersonation. Like if I had more this, time. This is gonna be this is gonna be rougher, but this is Bill Cosby for Oxycontin. <laughs> <laughs> when I am wanting to rape a bitch, I use the official day rape drug and pull up your pants. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got to start winding this up, man, because I really need to crash out and take a nap. No, that's understandable. Uh, I'm going to keep drinking bad Mexican beer. But, yeah, if you need to crash, you go ahead and crash. Let me pimp a few things, and that's going to take up a good chunk of time because I've got a few things to pimp here. First off, um, Pope on Film, you you can subscribe to us on iTunes. You can find us in the iTunes store by looking for Undead Cow. Dash the Pope on film. If you just do Undead Cow, you will bring up all the Undead Cow shows. So you'll bring up that and you'll bring up Dying Generation. You can also get the Pope on film on YouTube and listen to us there. And that's where we're hoping if enough people listen, we can get a couple of pennies off of that. So maybe before you go to work or something, or maybe you go to before you go to sleep, you just click on the Pope Pope on film playlist. And leave it. And then listen yeah. to it on, in, on iTunes on your way to work. That might be a yeah, good Nothing wrong with that. We are on Twitter at the, at, at Pope on Film. That's the Twitter handle. Uh, and like our Facebook page. Yeah. You could search it on Facebook, Pope on Film. Seems like you were doing a little pimping for that today. Cause no. Oh, oh yes, I have. Yes, I have. We got like 10 likes today. And I was watching yeah. it while I was at work going, like, what the fuck is going on? And I started looking at the people and, like, one mutual friend. <laughs> and it was you. And I was like, oh, good boy. Go for it. No, I I, um, I have I have enough. Uh, I have about 600 friends on my Facebook page. So yeah. some of them are going to stick. Cool. So that's good. Yeah. And if you want to email us, you can email us at Pope at undeadcow.com. So those are all the ways to get us and get in touch with the show and download the show, listen to the show, uh, all of that. I have another show coming up. Really? In a couple of weeks that I'm pretty excited about. Um, it is going to be called 
Destination Utopia. And Destination it is Utopia? Be, Destination Utopia. And okay. it is going to be a lot more of a political show. All right. Okay. Um, I was watching this documentary on Netflix called 1964, and I was struck by some of the things Lyndon Johnson was saying early in his presidential run, uh, where he was putting out that he was going to build the great society, and he was going to end poverty in America, and he was going to end racism in America. And whereas he totally pussied out on both of those things, what struck me is that when's the last time this this country or this society, even worldwide, has had an actual goal? That's a good you point. Know? When have we been working towards something that would make the world better? So that's where I came up with the idea where me and my partner, who is, uh, her name is Rose. Uh, she's a young girl. She's about 22. Young woman. Sorry, Rose. Oh, she was too me to say that. And she mm. is a fake relative of mine. She's, she's some relative of my girlfriend Jeannie's, and I forget what. Okay. Uh, a great niece or something like that or a great great I have no idea but she <clears throat> like a lot of the young people today I find them to be very lackadaisical and very you know I don't understand why they're not angrier you know that's yeah. what being young used to be all about you know she is one of the one of the angriest and most rebellious and most outspoken and just radical people of her age that I know, you know, this is the person who has one of her Facebook statuses posted, you know what? Fuck our troops. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know, and I, I had to go back at her a little bit about that, but not a lot because her basic premise was correct, is that most of the people – I very much believe in supporting our troops, okay? But I'm a bit of a different person. Her point was most people, like 99% of them, who say support our troops are not really saying support our troops. They're saying support our bullshit government policies. And it really doesn't have anything to do with the troops at all. Yeah. You know? So I was like, okay, right on, right on. She right now is going into various... Christian um, Facebook groups just to stir shit. <laughs> oh, I did that for a while. I did that for a while. That was fun. Yeah. She's currently arguing abortion in a few of these groups. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what we're going to do. We're going to, we're going to, as the premise, we are going to try to determine what we think the great society or utopia would be. And how do the things in the world right now, are, are they bringing us closer to that or pushing us further away? All right. I'm done with that. You know, so <clears throat> it should be fun. It should be a fun show. Um, yeah. Say about two weeks, I think the first episode will wind up coming out. We have some more That's awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm down with that. I support so that's, that. That's it for there, yeah. Yeah, so like the whole immigration thing that Obama just did, does that does that take us closer? Does it take us further away? Does it not really impact the future at all? Well, I live in I live in Oklahoma, so I live in a state that is just full of Obama conspiracy theories. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of those. One of these days, I'm going to start a riot because every time that I see a helicopter flying in the sky, I always want to do the same thing. 
I want to just go outside and scream, Oh my God, it's the black helicopter! Obama's finally coming for our guns, y'all! <laughs> Quick, hide in your bunkers! That you've been preparing! Mm-hmm. And it's like, boom, suddenly I'll be like a Jew on Christmas. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because there'll be nobody left on the, on the streets. They'll all be hiding in their bunkers from Obama and his, like, a death panel squad. And I'll just yeah. be free to go about my day. Something else I wanted to bring up, you know, because I, I, I think it's, you know, if we have an audience, it's a good place to address. You wrote a really good article on your blog today. Oh, oh God. God. Oh, God. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's talk about this. All right. So I found this article... I found this article on the internet, and it was about a 22-year-old Georgian man. He's a Latino man, and he was in a car with his friends, and they pulled into a driveway in Georgia. This was in 2013. They were waiting in the driveway to pick things, and some uh, angry white guy, because they pulled into the wrong driveway. And the owner of the house came out and fired a warning shot into the air. The young Latino man freaked out and backed up, but that wasn't enough for the guy. So the guy shot at the car, shooting him in the head and killing him dead. He was killed for pulling into the wrong driveway. And the man who shot him was fined $500 and will be on probation for a year. He got a slap on the wrist for killing a Latino man. Now, I work in the children's department of a of a uh, store, and I am a male, and I am a Latino. And my job is one of the hardest jobs in the world, not just because of racism, but also because of sexism. Because when you go into a store in Oklahoma, especially a children's department, of a store in Oklahoma, you don't expect uh-huh. to see a man in charge, and you also don't expect to see a Mexican in charge, and I'm a Mexican man, and it's very difficult because I would say about 60% of the people who I try to help do not want help from me. I've had some very racist experiences in my three years working here in Oklahoma that I do not want to talk about at the moment, but... This story about this Georgia man really affected me because I read about it once and then never heard about it again because Mm -hmm. the man is a Latino, and so nobody really cares. Nobody cares too much because it seems to be perfectly acceptable to be racist towards Latinos. The, the, The example that I used, and I didn't mention this in the article, But the example that I use is there's a really famous kid's book, and it's been out for about, I'd say, about a decade, and it's called Skippy John Jones. And it's about this white Siamese cat that dreams of being a chihuahua. So he puts on a wrestling-type mask. He puts on a bandito mask. He calls it a bandito mask. And a sombrero and he talks in broken English Spanish, and he sings this song, and it goes, My name is Capito Pepito. I like to eat the burritos. And he fights bad guys in in a desert landscape. And everybody is okay with this book, and it's read in schools, and kids love it, and kids sing along like with his... Like the Bandito, if you remember yeah. him. Yeah. Okay. It, it, but the, the, the example that I use is, let's change this book. Let's change this classic kid book, Skippy John Jones. I'm sure that the woman who seems to be a nice woman who wrote the book didn't mean to be racist, but let's change it slightly. What if this is a white Siamese cat who dreams of being a pit bull? Mm. So he puts on a gold chain and he puts on a big black afro Mm -hmm. and he puts on a very fat raider's jacket and starts talking in raps and starts talking yo, 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 I'm Skippy John Jones. I've come to bust a cap in your ass. Everybody would be offended because that is very offensive towards black people. There would be riot. There wouldn't be riots. There would be protests. People would stand up against this. It would be on the news. 
because mm-hmm. that is racist against blacks, and that's not acceptable. But this right. book is racist towards Mexicans, which is okay. So it's a classic, and it, my kids, my uh, youngest daughter, they read it in school. They drew pictures of Skippy John Jones. Because it's okay if it's Mexicans. Everybody hates Mexicans, but blacks, Asians, Native Americans, oh, no, we can't be racist towards them. And so I was very upset when I saw the ra- the, the riots that are happening in Ferguson over Michael Brown's death because I thought, well, if this person was Mexican, no one would care. So I wrote this article, and I I, I wrote it on my blog, and it's gotten – some pretty good traction, I think. I'm worried that people will be offended by it, and I'm also worried that people will not care about it. So if you could go to my blog and check this out, maybe uh, talk to your friends about it, share it, I would appreciate it. It's at uh, reverendsteve.blogspot.com. We can talk about race together. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to bring it up, because I did feel that it was an important article. Now, of course, there's only so much I can relate to it being an old white guy. But yeah. the the one thing that really bothers the fuck out of me is that, you know, the whole frenzy and anger and all of that over immigration is so incredibly racist. Mm-hmm. And so, so solvable that we can fix this, and it's really not any big deal, and it's simple. And I bet you that if we sat down with Bella for like an hour, she would come up with the goddamn answer herself. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. everybody's afraid about Mexicans coming over here, Mexicans coming over here, you know. Why doesn't anybody stop and think why? Okay? Yeah. Why are these people risking their lives to get into America? Besides, oh, well, America is so fucking great. Okay? We have a third world country to ourselves. How do we accept that? How do we accept having the country that would basically be watching our back if South America got all uppity, okay? How do we allow this? And if we put the energy into trying to help Mexico and bring Mexico up to the standards of the rest of of North America, us in Canada, why would a Mexican come here? It's a beautiful place. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't full of fucking drug lords. Yeah. You know, if they had a stable government. I have, you know. So if, I, we, I, if we, we, we can help other countries and we can also bomb other brown people, okay, and we can let corporations not really have to pay their taxes and stuff like that. But we can't help a neighbor. I also love the fact that I also love the fact that the majority of the people who are really against these Mexicans coming over here are devout Republican Christians. Mm -hmm. Which also which which again says so much about them. It's like, oh, yes, I'm a Christian, but I don't want Mexicans coming over here. Yeah. I have. I, yeah. I had a hard time pressing publish on the article that I wrote because yeah. it seemed as if I was speaking for Latino people and for people in Mexico because I've never felt like a Mexican. I have a hard right. time with race because I look very much like a Latino. And yet, when my parents left Mexico, they left Mexico for good. And so, when I grew up, I I didn't eat Mexican food. I I never learned Spanish. 
to this day, I hate Mexican. F- my favorite Mexican food is um, tacos, but with a Dorito shell, uh-huh. because those are damn good. But I hate Mexican food, and I hate spicy things. I don't know a lick of Spanish, and yet, I, like, for the longest time, I if someone asked me what race I was, I would just say, well, I'm an American. Yeah, I was born in Prescott, Arizona. I mm-hmm. grew up loving professional wrestling and comic books. I'm American. What what yeah. do you want from me? But mm-hmm. it, it, it's, I, I am in a difficult position because I am too white for the brown people, but I'm too yeah. brown for the white people. So I am in this bizarre area where I'm caught between two races. I consider myself an American. I love America. It's a wonderful country. I don't consider myself Mexican at all. I don't know my culture. The closest thing I come to being a Mexican is occasionally my son and I will watch the Disney movie The Three Caballeros together. Yeah. But that's about it. But it but I'm here I am and I moved to Oklahoma and everyone assumes like like a, about a month ago I'm at work and I have a, a handful of books, and I'm putting them away. I have a name tag, and I just finished talking to a customer on the phone in English. And there's a customer just looking at me, and I, I and I, I turn to them, and I'm about to say, can I help you? And the person starts talking to me in Spanish. <laughs> and so I, I got to do the wonderful, uh, 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 no habla espanol. <laughs> They're like, "Oh, you're American," and I'm like, "Yeah, I, yes, I am. Can I help you?" Sorry if that surprises you. <laughs> yeah. Mhm. And the and the but best I, the best idea we can come up with is build a big fucking wall on the border. <laughs> yeah. And people think that that actually makes sense. Uh, yeah. This world just kind of frightens me, and I'm glad I'm old and will probably die soon. Because <laughs> I don't like where it's heading, and I really don't want to see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's sure perfectly it's acceptable to be racist as long as you're racist towards Latinos. Mm-hmm. That's why I I did in high school. I did this wonderful thing, and it, here we are. We have an audience, so I might as well share it. I realized that everyone does not want to be racist, but being racist is fun. So I came up with a fake race, so that everyone could have the fun of being racist without actually offending anyone. So okay. so I came up with the pooks. Sapooks. They always wear yellow shirts, they drive slow, and their food smells horrible. Uh-huh. If yeah. you want to be racist, just blame everything on the pooks. Okay. That's what I do. I'm like, damn pooks. God, I hate these damn pooks. Always coming mm-hmm. over here with their loud music doing bad things. I hate the pooks. The stupid pooks. Because, see, then you have the fun of being a racist son of a bitch, but you're not offending anyone. Yes. Yeah. So if you're going to blame anything on anyone, don't blame it on Mexicans. Just blame it on the pooks. We can all gather together in our hatred of the pooks and have fun. That sounds like a good idea. That that may be viable. Yeah. It's just blame the at just blame the pooks. At least until we get it out of our system. Yeah. Yeah. And because nobody you, wants to be racist, but it's just so fun to have a villain in your life, you know? And to any Mexicans who may be listening to this, who may have been offended by anything I might have said because it's not like I've done a detailed study on this, but at least accept my heart's in the right place. Okay? Yeah. So yeah. So maybe if I painted a worse picture of Mexico than is actually, you know, 
at least I'm saying let's help. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, Besides, it, you're it, not the villain. There's thing. a villain here. It's the damn clickers. It's the damn clickers, yes. Yeah. Hate those yeah. clickers. But I gotta go pass out, my friend. Yes. You go pass out. This has been a good episode. Yes, it has. And I've until got, next week. Go ahead. I've got, you, I've got an idea for next week. Yes. Um, this is going to be crazy, but I want to do two films. For the same show, I wanted, okay. I want to do a compare and contrast because I, I've i got on my YouTube page, uh, Reverend Steve, I've got the remake of A Bucket of Blood, The Death Artist. Uh-huh, okay. Starring Anthony Michael Hall and Shadow Stevens which is a 90s remake of the Roger Corman film A Bucket of Blood, which I want to have sex with because I love it so much. Uh-huh. So okay. I thought if we're ever going to do two films, that this might be a good one, A Bucket of Blood and then its remake. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you. That does sound like a good idea. Let's Let's do that. So you want to do that for next week's show? Yeah, because I haven't I haven't had the heart yet to watch the remake all the way through because I love the original so much. Mm-hmm. But literally, I spent a decade trying to find this remake. You would think that that Will Ferrell's first movie would be easy to find, but somehow I had to spend a whole decade looking for this film. Yes, and when, and the last time you brought it up, I found it and I threw it in, into my queue. Good. On YouTube, so I, I, well, I it, it took there. a decade for me to find the movie, and then I put it on my YouTube page, and and I expected it to automatically be yanked, but it stayed there, and I think it stayed there because people don't know that this thing exists. <laughs> that, that, that there's a that there's a yeah that there's like a '90s remake of a Roger Corman film that features Will Ferrell and David Cross. You you don't expect this thing to... It's like a bizarre anomaly that this thing actually exists. Mm Mm-hmm. But I figure if I'm ever going to actually sit down and and watch this movie all the way through, that it should be for this podcast. Let's do it. All right. Let's definitely do it, and we can do a compare and contrast... I really have to work on Skype and figure out how to get Skype going good because what I would really like to do one day as kind of like a special episode, yeah, you know, uh, apart from the regular, I would like us to pick a movie and do a do a com- a running commentary on it. That would be awesome. You know, something that would that we be really start awesome. Start at the same time, and we'll sit here and we'll watch the movie, and we will comment. <laughs> That would be awesome. I've always wanted to do a running commentary for the Disney movie, The Three Caballeros. Yeah. Because it's a Disney animated film, and yet it's it's something that no one has, that the majority of America hasn't seen, because if they have, then they'd be revolting on the streets because of how absolutely bizarre it is. <laughs> I'm sure I probably saw it as a kid, but I have not seen it. Like, There's one song in the movie, one musical number that's pretty much all about sex. Yeah. Really? Yeah. There's a woman in Bahia. There's a woman, and she's the she sells cookies, uh-huh. and so she's going around the town, and she's really attractive. She's going around the town asking any of the men if they want to eat her cookies. And they keep singing, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, and chasing her. Oh, man. It, it, it's, really, it's a really messed up song, and it's a Disney movie. And also there's the fact that, like, okay, I understand that Walt Disney wanted to make a movie to comfort our friends in Latin America during World War II in the hopes that they don't turn Nazi or communist. But yeah. I don't fully know exactly how this movie was made. How do I know that Walt Disney 
didn't just get all of the women with black hair who worked in his studio and got them to I I'm not sure if all of the people in this movie are Mexicans is what I'm saying. Okay. I'm just saying how did how how am I one hundred percent certain that Walt Disney didn't just get all of the black haired women secretaries in his office and put them in bikinis and say, Okay, pretend to speak Spanish. We're gonna film you. <laughs> it's it's the it's the absolute weirdest Disney movie that has ever been made and I've always wanted to do commentary for it, so that might be in the future. But next week a bucket of blood and the death artist. Okay. Definitely. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. Yes, yeah, that's I I'm I'm excited about that. Anything you want to pimp before we wind it up? Anything I want to pimp? Um boobs? Boobs. I want to pimp boobs. They're boobs really wonderful. They're squishy. Um, you can put them in bras or just have them out. You know, they can feed some infants, and they're uh-huh. they're just fun to look at. You know. Yes. So uh, boobs, you should try them. You should also go to the official Church of Edwood page. It's at edwood dot org. It's been there for a number of years. And through there, you can go, you can find a bunch of things. You can email me. You can go to my blog. I have this store that I make no money on where you can buy really bizarre shirts. Um, you can see videos and stuff. It's really awesome. So you should go to edwood.org. Learn about the Church of Edwood. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Does, does the store actually still exist? Because that used to be Cafe Press, right? No, it's still Cafe Press, and it still exists. I, I make maybe about twenty dollars a year from that store, but I work so much on that store that I'm probably losing money on the deal. But the store yeah. still exists, and it's pretty awesome. I really got to get myself a baseball hat from there. Yeah, yeah. I still have. I bought a uh, a messenger bag from there like about six years ago, and I still use it all of the time. And it's it's yeah. wonderful. It's it's starting to fall apart, but really six years for a messenger bag, I think is a pretty good deal. That's a that good would, period in time. That would be my official directing hat when yeah. I whenever I actually break down and do it because seriously, it, the, the you know I have my long hair, the hair gets in my eyes, stuff like that. I could really use a hat like that. So. Yeah, I'm going to have to do that. And there's also a donation button there, which I would encourage everybody to click on if you got yes. a couple of a, a little bit of spare change to help them to defray the cost. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Church of Edwood is not bilking money out of anybody ever. So you know. Yes. Chuck chuck a little change. Help them help them. You know, pay for the website and stuff. There's something that's very religious to me about being insanely broke because Ed Wood was broke for all of his life and he somehow found a way to still make a ton of movies yeah. that people to this day still love. So, yeah. yeah, I've always been broke and I've always had a hard problem with money. And so I'm not above being able to say on my blog, hey, if you want to donate to the Steve is Broke Fund, uh, you can do that. It is available. Mm-hmm. Edward.org. Exactly. So, until next week, I am Bunny Williams, and with me is... Reverend Steve Galindo. Have a good day. We, Have a good week. We should, we should come up with some sort of an end tag. We sort of should. Thing we, should have again. A discussion. we should have a discussion offline one day. Yeah. And work out. Good luck and, and big balls. Exactly. Yeah. You know, because we we could also get a lot of listeners by taking breaks and doing promos for the podcast. And we yeah. have to come up with some promos for hours. You know, and swap them back and forth, things like that. 
Yeah, we got to come up with something. Yeah. Uh, but I'm gone. Have a good night now, man. All right. Bye. Bye.